So this is what's going to happen. Um, we're going to talk about, let me just tell you what is the plan. Next week is our last week, right? Correct? Next week is our last week. So this is what, our, what we're going to do in these two weeks. So today I'm going to talk about function te templates and go through overview of Actually, overview of polymorphism, I'll do it the next day when I bring the whole animal kingdom. The animal thing that I have done, please review it. The next time, I'm going to bring lots of different animals in a hierarchy and show you how the real, the whole design works. Okay? So you can see the big picture of how the and the virtuals and all the things work. Okay? Um, that's that one. So this is what we're going to talk about later. I'll talk about today. Um, I'll try to look at it, see if there is anything uh, important to go through, okay? Um, and I'll see if we don't know it, I'll go through it, but uh, overview of polymorph polymorphism, we'll do that. Talking about cast, typecast, and things like that, we'll talk about it next week. So um, the new type of casting in C++, not C type casting. So we're going we're gonna to talk about our temp templated casting. But today, we're just going to talk about function templates, go through it, kind of understand how it works. Uh, and uh, 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 we're going to do a little bit of overloading. Tonight, we have the session at 9 o'clock. Fingers crossed if nothing goes wrong again. Uh, I'm going to actually send an Outlook invitation to all of you with a time and a method of connection and everything in the description of Outlook. So, so you're going to have to get an invitation, reply you're attending. I want to know how many people are attending, okay? Um, and it's going to be just overloading, not only overloading, we're going to go through, I'll try to do it in the hierarchy too, in the hierarchy of inheritance. Anyways, so that's that one. Now, um, <coughs> hello. Um, I'm going to write uh, a function. I'm going to say, I hope everybody understands what this function do, uh, what, what this function does. So int a, int b. Is everybody okay with the function? It's giving me an error. Can you believe it? All right. That's how IntelliSense is intelligent. Anyways, so. I have a function right over int, uh, uh, int add, int a, int b, and, and it returns a plus b. Everybody's OK with that? Nothing mysterious about it. So if I have over here integer a, um, v1, v2, I want to have different names. v1 and v2, OK? So in here, if I have int a, int b, int c, I can say, and I, if I have values in here, so a is 10, b is 20, I can say c is add of a and b. I know it's a silly question. What is the output of this program? <laughs> Everybody thinks there's a trick in here. <laughs> what is the output of this program? 30, right? 30. OK, we know that, right? Good. So we are on the track. <laughs> All right. Now, if I have something like this, double uh, x, double y, and I have double z. And if I say over here, z is set to add x and y. What is the output of this program? It's 
It's got to be three, right? That's right. Three years later, four years later, possible loss of data, I know. And we have three. Why that happened? Because first, it downcasts x to an integer, correct? So that drops the 1. Then it downcasts y to another integer, drops the point 2. Then it adds the two, in the two integers, 1 and 2. Then it upcasts that 1 to z. Are you OK, my friend, over there? OK, no CPR needed? You're good? OK, mouth to mouth, you're OK? <laughs> all right, all right, so, 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 yeah. Um, so the, it upcasts it, so that 3, integer 3, goes up over here, becomes 3.0. And that's what you saw got printed. Are we OK with this? All right? I don't want that. I have polymorphism in C, C++. I have add over there. Why can't they just create another add and let the compiler choose it for me? So instead of having that, I'm going to have this one, and I'm going to say over here, double. Now what is the output of this program? It's going to be 3.3. .3. Why? Because my beautiful compiler over here, what it's going to do is that it's going to have all these beautiful values. The first add is called because it's called add int int. It goes to the integer one, calls the integer, OK? And as you see, so by the way, I had a friend in the office today, and he didn't know actually we do. How, this is how we debug, OK? So for all those with memory, memory problems, this is how you debug. You see I'm going step by step on it. I'm pressing F10 over and over. How do you know which button to push? You go to B debug, and it says F10 step over, F11 step into, Shift F11 get out. OK? So now I am in this function. If I wanted to get out of this function, I put Shift F11, and poop, it comes out where it came from, right? Now I'm going to press F10. It goes to the next one. I press, if I press F11, and you have installed the source code of C++. It actually goes inside C out and tells you how C out works. So C, I'm going to do F11. Nothing happened. Why? Because I don't have those things installed. If you install all that code, it actually goes onto it in, in IO stream and starts debugging C out. I'm going to press F10, F11 again, because I'm at the beginning of the, if I press F10, it jumps over and runs at as whole. If I press F11, it steps into and goes in there. So I'm going to press F11. Now it goes inside. Now as you see, the double is selected. How did it know? Because it has add double double with sugar. OK? So two doubles over here, right? So add double double. And because it's add double double, it matches add double double. Therefore, it goes in there and calls the add double double. And comes back. And we're going to have the 3.3 .3 coming out. Are we OK with this? Any problem with this? Are we OK? Are we OK one? Are we OK two? So, so let me see if I can find something more interesting in here. Sure, why not? Let's use this one. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to have this beauty over here. Da 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 da. A class called container. Okay? Container has, uh, oh, this is old, using my old. Uh, Notation for thing. Let me just do uh, control H. So value will change to M underline value. Replace all. There we go. Now it's in current version. Okay. So container is a container of an integer. I'm holding an integer in it. Why? Because I like it. Okay. So it's holding an integer. And it has a constructor. 
sets the value to the value that it comes, and it has a default construct sets it to zero. Now, uh, int value const returns the value out. Void value, the value sets the value to whatever I want to set. Are we okay down to here? Everything's good? Okay. And int operator int const, what does it do? It casts the container to an integer, which means if I cast the container to an integer, it's going to return the integer value out for me. Okay? I don't know why I have it in here. Do I need it if, you know, at all? No, let me remove it. That's going to be confusing. It's, we're going to talk about this overload tonight. Let me just remove it. All right, I think this is good now. And the operator thingy over here, the overload for operator for uh, the uh, C out, O stream, prints the value of container. So it says C dot value is that value, okay? Shows what is the value of C. So no, I shouldn't say C dot, I have to say, better to say container value is that. So it prints the value of the container. Are we okay with this? Any problem down to here? All right, so I'm going to add one more thing to this container. I'm going to overload the plus operator for the container, OK? So I'm going to say a container of mine. Uh, actually, let's not, oh, let's not do it. Let's, let's just go like this and see what happens. So now I'm going to create the container. So I'm going to say container, uh, container, A, B, C, X, Y, Z, I, J, K. I, J, K it is. Uh, so container I, uh, I'll put 5. Uh, container J, I'll put 10. Container K, and I'm going to do the exact same thing that I have done for this. I'm going to say K is stupid compiler. All right. <laughs> All right. And that's going to be I, and that's going to be J, and I'm C out and K. I want, so I'm going to actually write the at as I've done for the other two. So in here, I'm going to say, what I'm going to say, I'm going to say container. Any problem with this? Will it add the value of the two containers? Will this thing add, let me just bring these down. You know how these ads work. So I have a container. People at the back, can you see it or it's too small? Anybody have problems seeing it? Too small? No? Okay. So, because I wanted everything to actually, let me just, maybe if I do this, then I can make it bigger. Yeah. So, in here, I, I, I created a function called uh, add exactly like add ints and add double to return the value, the, the sum of the value of two containers. But it's not going to work because container doesn't know what plus is. It doesn't have any definition for it. It's not overloaded for it, correct? So for this to work, I have to overload it. How do I overload it? Simple. In here, I'm going to say container. Because it's a binary operator, not unary, uh, I don't need to work it like by nature. If I overload plus correctly, after plus happens, v1 and v2 should remain the same. They can change. It doesn't have a side effect. It's not like plus equal. If it has plus equal, then v1 would have changed. Because I don't want v1 to I'm good over here. I'm going to say container, and I'm going to say uh, operator plus. At right side, I'm getting in a container, right? So I'm part of const. 
container reference C, and this is not going to change me, right? So what happens, this operator of mine at right hand side, it has a con uh, container. At left side, it's the owner, which is the, at left side, it is the owner which is the container, so this plus belongs to V1, and it should return a container out, correct? It should build a container out of these two and return it. Ah, that's no problem with me. I can, this is one of those parts that a temporary nameless object is good for you. The only case that you can actually do it. All those who use star this equals to date, star this equals to this and that, that's not good. Here, okay, I'll tell you what. So in here, I'm going to say return container. So I'm creating a temporary nameless container out of what? M value of mine plus C's M value. So what happens, it's very simple. Operator plus gets the two values, creates a temporary nameless object, and returns it. Because it's by value, it's going to be temporary nameless anyway. Compiler is smart. You know that when you return something by value, copy constructor is called, right? We know that. If something is returned by value, is copy constructor is called. Guess what? If you return a temporary nameless object, compiler is smart. It says, this is already a nameless object. Why do I need to create a nameless object out of a nameless object? I'm just going to pass this all along. Because it's already nameless, nothing's going to happen. It just returns that nameless out. So that nameless comes out, and that's when this is going to work. You see? That red thing is gone. Now the container is working, so therefore, now my code can work properly. I can actually run this and go step by step. As you see, it's kind of a review of everything. I'm mean, doing operator overload too. But anyways, so we're going to come over here. These, all we know it works. Okay, and now the container, container is getting created. So it comes over here, sets the value to 5. So the first container has 5. The second container has 10. So the value becomes 10. And the third container will be defaulted, which means it's going to be 0 and sets the value to 0. Now the first add calls the integer. It goes and returns, so it goes add, add int int and prints it out. The second one goes again, add double double and prints that out, right? And now the third one calls the add for containers. It goes over there. Now it says container one plus container two. It goes to the operator overload, creates a temporary nameless object, out of the two values that are 5 and 10. So it, now a temporary nameless is getting created with the value 15 in it. The temporary nameless then comes over here, gets returned where? Right over k. A shadow copy is going to happen because there is no copy constructor. Therefore, k will hold that value when it comes. And when we look at the value of k, k has 15. Now it wants to print it with c out. It goes up over here and says container value is 15, and the program is done. Are we OK with what I just created? Are we OK here? Are we OK here? I just want to demonstrate that I had three objects in here. These three objects could work with the plus operator. Integer, double, and container. Three objects that operator plus was actually defined for them. Are we OK with this? Now, I wanted to write an add function for some unknown reason because I'm nuts. Those add function will receive the two objects and applies the add operator and returns whatever they make. Because I want this add to be polymorphic, so I, I wrote three adds. So from my point of view, the, 
from my point of view, the uh, sorry, from programmer's point of view, program is just calling one function, right? Add, 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 correct? But from the designer point of view, when I look at it, I actually have three adds in here. One, two, three. You know what kind of polymorphism I call this? Fake polymorphism. <laughs> You'll see later on when we come to the whole polymorphism thingy, overview all of them. I call this fake. It fakes it. Compiler, when it actually creating, when it's creating these three ads, it just, it doesn't create a fun function called add. You know what it will call that function? It will call the first function add int int, add underline int underline int. It calls the second one add underline double underline double. It calls the third one add underline container underline container. Therefore, there are three different names. Nothing's polymorphic in here. What is polymorphic? doing the same thing in different ways. Now there are three functions, different functions. So no magic is happening. It's, this is pretending to be polymorphism. I call it fake polymorphism. We'll come and I'll show you which, in which category it, it fails. So function overloading, it looks like polymorphism, but it's not. Are we okay down to here? Are we okay? Are we okay one? Are we okay two? Yes, sir. Can you pass this to my friend over there? Actually, you keep it because you're the questionnaire over there. <laughs> go, go, go. Um, so with, oh, yeah. um, so with um, operator overloading, um, so I don't know, it's still not clear in my mind, but maybe this might make it clearer that should we always use operator overloading with like class objects or we can use, there's, there are other uses other than that. Okay. The answer is in world word overloading. What does it what does overload mean? Overload means changing the meaning of an already existing operation. You cannot you cannot make the plus work differently for a double. Because you cannot say from now on I want a plus not to add anything to it. You can't do that. You cannot wipe the old one and put something new. Overloading means something, some object that doesn't have an operator that other objects have. Let me add that operator to it to make sure it works in a certain way. So that's why overloading works with object and something else. If you have two integers, it already has a plus. You cannot change it. There is no other signature. You cannot say, now I want the plus between two integers do minus. No, you can't do that. But if you have an employee and a plus, you can say, OK, I'm going to make the plus with an employee add that value to its salary. So you make the plus work for employee in a new way. Therefore, Overloading. Okay? That was a good question. Are we okay with this? Do we understand what, what we will? Okay, no. Take a look at these. Let's, let's actually stop it. Take a look at these three functions. If I can actually separate them successfully. The person who has the microphone over there, my lady, one of you, pick up the microphone. What is different between these functions? When you look at it, what do you call, what, what is different between these functions? If you want to say, if I hold you, Tell me the difference between of the, like these functions. What is different between them? Um, pass or you want to pa pass? Is it a pass? Yeah. Pass it to the student. You want to, do you want to answer or you want to pass it? Pass it. Give it to the gentleman. Okay. Um, I think the types. The types are different, right? The types. Is the logic different? No. Everything is identical. 
So if I wanted you to write this, like if I wanted you to write an ad for me for another object to come, how could I tell you to do it? How could I give you instructions to write an ad function, another ad function for me, for an employee, another ad function, for a transcript? These are all objects, classes. Another ad function for coffee cup. I want the coffee cup to have an ad function so I can add two coffee cups and have the coffee, whatever, okay? So, so I want to do, how do I give you instructions? I'm going to tell you, hey, when you are writing a function, please, writing an ad function, first put the type, then write the ad function, then put the type again, then write the first one, then another type, exactly the same thing. That's V2. And at the end, return them. V1 plus V2. Correct? If I really wanted to, like, and I told you, replace the type with the new class that you want this thing to overload. Are we okay with this? It's not a big thing. You can do it, right? So can the compiler. All I need to do is to say template class type and remove all these. I'm just telling to the compiler, hey, anyone wants to use the ad, take a look at the signature of the ad. The first ad has int, ad, int, int. It will automatically replace all the types for add and creates a function for you. Whoosh. And the next, and the next, and the next. So it looks at your calling, and with your calling, it's going to generate the code for you like a programmer. So if I do not, like right now, if I compile this, because I have three different calls to add right now, if I compile this, because I have three different calls to add, three versions of that function will be generated by compiler automatically. Come on, you can do it. There you go. If I, if I just, because there are three of them, right? If I remove all the ads from here, no function will get created. That code means nothing. Compiler won't even generate the logic for you because it's not needed. Am I? Yes. Can you explain the syntax of the template class? Template class is just a placeholder. It tells you which one is a placeholder. Template, the word template over there says the scope that is following is a template. You know what a template is? You had templates as a child. You know, you put over there, you draw it in triangle. You draw it a star, draw Mickey Mouse. Remember that, templates? This is a template. And the holes on the template is the placeholder. So the type over there, I don't have to put over type over there. I can write over here my favorite thing, hee-haw. Voila, it's a placeholder. It still works. I'm going to say template class, yeehaw, and then yeehaw, add, yeehaw, we want yeehaw, we too. It works. It doesn't care what it is. It just knows that the placeholder's name is yeehaw, which means the things that is, types that is supposed to change, those are yeehaw. So essentially placeholders. Therefore, template means the scope that is following is to be generated. It's the template that the compiler is supposed to work with it. What needs to get replaced? Those are the variables, the, vari uh, the, the types. Now, if you needed to use that type inside the code of the function, you could have used it. We're gonna, I'm going to give you examples of that. We're going to see one by one. I'm going to write another uh, template, and we'll see exactly how things are going to happen. But that's exactly what it is. Very simple. Very straightforward. Yes. One more time. Instead of making, you don't only make only two functions or double int, which can be empty, same with the template, which can all. Yeah. 
See, but that's, that's the thing. First of all, let me just change this at least to capital T. That hee is bothering me. <laughs> okay. You were talking, you were talking about, and I was just hee in my brain. <laughs> now, 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 now tell me. So you're saying, you're saying by adding this because I called it, it's going to generate it automatically? Is that the question? Yes, yes, we had three ads, yeah. No, 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 it's going to, okay. The question was, I should have given, I, I, but it's okay. So the question was, since I have a template over here, it's going to just run, run this through all, run, run all these three through all that template? The answer is no. It will actually write three functions for you. You're going to have three separate functions. Of course, when I walk through it, it's going to go through that code. But in reality, if you look at the assembly code generated, if you look at the machine code generated, you'll see you have three functions. So essentially, now this is really polymorphism. You have one template, and that template is decided by the language. So by your request, new functions are going to get generated, literally generated. And if you have no call, there is no code for add at all anywhere. It's not going to get created. All right? But remember when I just created an add for container, and I did not have a plus operator, it didn't work? Remember that? and I had to actually overload the plus operator, that's something that you have to do. So whenever you create a template or you are using a template, you should look at the operations that the template is applying to the type. Those operations must exist in your class that is using the template, otherwise it won't work. If I have another class employee and employee doesn't have a plus operator, I cannot use the add for it because it doesn't know how to handle plus. You have how many? Two questions. That deserves a microphone. Get it from your friend over there. OK. What happens if we send the character to the function? And Single character? Yeah. And what happens if we send a double and an uh, integer to the? OK. <coughs> it ex OK. First of all, what happens if I send the character to it? OK. Let me show you. Character CH1. Mm. Okay. Character CH2. Character CH. So what happens essentially if I do this? Let me put it right at the beginning. Oops. So CH is set to CH1, CH2, and CH. If I compile, you'll see that. This is going to happen. Perfectly, so you have character add, character v1, character v2. Do we have anything but ASCII number in characters? Dun, da, da, da. Character is nothing but a small integer. If you said character pointer, then we would think. If you said a string, C style string, then we would talk about it. But a single character is, an, is a character. It's just a small integer. And it will call and return. Of course, what you're going to have is going to be something very awkward. This is what you're going to get. Because you have the ASCII code of A, plus ASCII code of B, 
and now it's going to print it as a character. You don't know what it's going to be. So it's essentially 65 plus 66. That is what? 131? Whatever is 131, that's going to get printed. Okay? The next one you said, what, what if one is integer, one is double? This is what you're saying, right? If, let me, before I actually do it, I'm going to tell you this. Close your eyes for a second. Put yourself in compiler's shoes, okay? If you have, with that, two doubles, two doubles are created. So you have double, 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 right? And you have an integer and a double. And you have an integer and an integer. If you had two functions, one was int, 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 the other one double, double, double. And then you called the function with an int and a double. Could you as a programmer walk through it, see which one I'm supposed to go to? You didn't know which one is going to, yeah, but which one? Is it going to cast a double to an int or an int to a double? I don't know which one I'm supposed to create. Should I cast? Because of these doubts, compiler will act exactly the same. So if you're not 100% clear how that thing's going to get generated, it's going to give you an error. It's going to tell you, hey, you told me they're all T's, but I, I, I don't know how to deal with it. And it's not going to create it. Of course, what I could do over here was this. I'll talk about that later. I wanted to say I could add the second class and make T and T2. Okay? So I have two different types in here. Then it wouldn't have a problem. But I, I don't want to go too much into it. But let's put it this way. Look at the template that you are creating. If you can't figure out how it's going to get called, it means compiler won't figure it out either. It has to be crystal clear. We'll come to multi-element templates later on, but not now, okay? Yeah, yeah. You can. There, it's called specialization. It's too rich for our blood at this moment. You can actually say, this is a template for add, but if such a thing happens, pick this template. So you can overload the templates, if I could call it. We call it specialization. So you can say, this is a template for all types, but if it was a pointer, do it this way. So you can specialize a template to act on a specific situation. You can have a secondary template created for that situation. Therefore, this works for all types, but if it was an employee, this one would happen. Okay? We are not covering that here. It's uh, next semester. You'll see it. Perfect questions. Yes? Yeah, for now, you have to make it as clear as possible so you don't have any collisions. Okay? So keep that in mind. I know it's not a perfect thing. I understand that, but... And I'm going to remove that character thingy, but it does, because it doesn't kind of, it becomes confusing. It doesn't, it's a wrong template for a character. I know it's going to work. It's not going to give you an error, but who wants to add two characters? It doesn't make sense. Okay? So, again, templates, remember, Compiler is just a program. It's kind of smart, but as smart as it's programmed to be. So it cannot figure everything up, out. So if, I, if you create a template for something, you are better to be sure that when you are calling that action, it is what you want to do and not other stuff, N not something as general as add.
because someone may come and try to add two strings and it thinks it's going to concatenate them. But it won't. If I have a character pointer here, character pointer is just going to add the two addresses and go somewhere in memory, crash, segmentation fault. It's not going to give you an error. Compiler blindly is going to replace the type with character pointer types. It doesn't know that character pointer is actually an external memory thingy that it has to go. That falls under the category of specialization, where you have to say, do the add like this, but if the type was character pointer, do it this way. So you write the second template for it, and you specialize it. That we're going to learn later. No, now. Are we OK down to here, hopefully? Are we OK one? OK, so let's go for a break, and then we come back, and I'm going to continue. Let's continue. OK. So Let's remove all these for now. Let's say, OK, attention, please. Stop the small talk, please. OK, now, what I wanted to say was that uh, last semester, at the end of the semester, you had something called algorithms. Remember that? And in the algorithm part, you had something called bubble sort. Remember that bubble sort thingy that you could sort stuff? Everybody's looking at me as I'm talking some foreign Martian language. Bubble sort? You don't remember bubble sort? Remember sort? Sorting? That was bubble. OK? So <laughs> OK, so that's called bubble sort. OK, it's, uh, OK, OK, so, so essentially the sort was like this. So you had actually, uh, it was written like, so you had void sort. OK? To sort, you passed an array, right? Let's say you want to sort integers. Integer A, that's an array. Then you had the size, so we're going to say integer size. And then you had which direction you want to sort it, ascending or descending. So Boolean ascending. And I'm, by default, I'm going to set it to true. So I want to sort few integers, OK? Now, to do this, if you recall, we, we had uh, uh, um, two loops that are happening, uh, two nested loops. So essentially, we are saying for int, uh, for i set to uh, 0, and i less than size minus 1, and i plus plus. So I don't want to go, th if you don't remember how did it work, please go home and find out. I don't want to reteach sorting, OK? It, it sorts an array, trust me, and it's called bubble sort. OK, so, and the second one, you do an inner loop, so you essentially browse through everything. Uh, what it, how it works is like this, so when you have series, why you leave these things over here in the new right? Seriously? <laughs> All right. So how bubble sort works is like this. You have your elements that you want to sort. I'm sorry, people who are listening to the recording, like, I was going to go, what the heck is he talking about? For your information, I'm drawing on a whiteboard, and you can't see it. So what happens is that you can actually, uh, sorry. Yeah, so as I was saying, 
you have, these are the, the things that you have that you want to sort, okay? So what, what happens is that you go through it once and you compare the neighboring things. So it checks these two. If, if you want to do it ascending, it checks. Is this thing bigger than this one? If it is, because you want to make it ascending, it switches its spaces. So it puts that one here and then it checks this one and this one. So these two. And then it checks these two and these two and these two. And it keeps going like that and switches the place if they are not properly in order. And it repeats that. Again, it goes back up and repeats one less this time. So the second time, it does this much because the, the, this, the biggest one is pushed down. Okay? And then the next one, it does this one. And the next one, it does this one. And the next one, it does this one. And this one. And finally, it does this one, and this, everything is sorted. So that was the reason they call it bubble sort is that it, if you make it upside down, it pushes everything up, and, and then so one by one, everything gets sort like bubbles that goes up on the air. I don't know who named it. The guy was crazy probably, but that's that's what it is. Uh, anyway, so so that's what I was doing. Essentially, I was actually saying, so that's the first loop. I go from, from beginning to size minus one, so I compare them two by two. Then I'm going to compare the next time. I'm going to go this time j start from zero and j less than uh, size, size minus i this time, because uh, if last one went 10 times, now this one has to go nine, right? It, it, it's always one less than that minus i minus 1 and j plus plus and in here so in here so these two for loops compares all the neighboring things over and over in this inner loop all i need to do is to check the two if it's not in the order i want then i'll change them so i'm going to say if it is ascending else. So if it's ascending, essentially if a j is greater than a j plus 1, the next one, okay, if it's ascending and the first one is bigger than that one, that's not right. I have to swap the two, right? So I'm going to say swap. Change the two. But in here, I'm going to do it exactly reverse. So in here, I'm going to say, I'm going to do it exactly the reverse scenario, which means if it is less than that, because I'm doing ascending, if I'm doing ascending, then if I'm doing this, uh, that's uh, ascending. If I'm doing descending, then I cannot have the first one being small. I have to switch it, right? Then I'll do the swap. But what is the swap? Swap between these two. So that function swap is supposed to swap the two. So how does that work? A swap is essentially void swap. I'm gonna ha I have two integer pointers, right? Integer pointer A, integer pointer B. And in here, I'm going to create a temporary integer and set it to the content of A. Then I'm going to say content of A is content of B. Now I'm going to say content of B is the one that was in temp. So I, the, the values are switched. OK? So that's my swap. Very simple, very straightforward, very easy. And now all I need to do is to actually call the swap with those uh, uh, array elements in them. So I'm going to pass the address of AJ and address of AJ plus 1 and it's going to swap the two if it's not the way I want it. Therefore, it sorts them. So, and I'm going to do the exact same thing over here. I'm going to give you a challenge. Can you make this thing work? Because if you look at it, it's a challenging thing. I want to see if you can do it out. Remove that if ascending and else and only have one if statement so it works. It's all with logical operators, if you can do that. But first, learn the templates. Don't waste your time with that. See, uh, that's uh, like a, 
challenge thinking. Anyways, so that's sorting. So essentially, what it does, it simply sorts things that I want to sort. Say if I have a few variables of type integer, and I want to sort them, all I need to do is to pass that values to the sort function. And I'm not saying ascending because it's true by default. And then I, if I, after doing this, if I actually print them one by one, then it's gone. I'm trying to see which one is actually printing this. Ah, that's the one. There you go. So if I print them one by one, now it's going to be sorted. So essentially, this is what's happening. That's my sort. There you go. See, now all those values are sorted in ascending order, as you see. Those are the values that I added there, and now they are sorted. Magic. OK? Are we OK with this? Walk through it at home. How do you walk through it? Keep press, go, press F10. So what, this is what you do. Press F10. You come over here. And now you have the values over here, as you see. Right? Then press F11. You go in here and then go F10, F10, F10. Look. There we go. And come over here. Go back. Keep doing this. And see, now it's swapping the two values. So walk through it one by one and see how it works. Or you can put messages in there and things like that. So again, walk through it to see how it works. Anyways, so, but my point was that I have written a function that sorts things. OK? Beautiful. I want it to be able to sort anything. Why do I have to keep writing the same bubble sort, same algorithm for different things? What if I have cars and I want to sort them based on, based on their license plate? What if I have employees and I want to sort them based on their last name? What if I have students and I want to sort them based on their GPA? Yeah. Okay? So what if I want to do that? If I want to do something like this, then why do I have to rewrite the sort over and over and over? It's better not to do that, right? I have the algorithm, correct? That's perfect to write a template. So what do I do? I'm going to convert these to template. How do you convert to template? You get the logic that you want, and you simply convert it to a template the way it's supposed to be. See what is the type that is playing the role, and then convert it to a template. Now, let's take a look at that swap thingy. OK? If I take a look at that swap thingy, and I write over here, so to write a template, I'm going to say template. Class. Oh, you could write type name over here too. Type name, class, potatoes, potatoes. One is C99, the other one is C after C11. But they are the same thing. So I like class. You can write type name. Anyways, class, I'm going to write over here type. OK? So now, let's think. I don't know why it's giving me. There you go. So now I have a template, right? So. What is important? What is the key role in here? What is the type? The int is the type, right? So instead of int pointer, it should be a type pointer, not type. I have to, if I want to swap the value of two things, I have to have a type pointer. OK. So in here, I'm going to say, so I'm going to change this to type and change this one to type. OK, int temp. The temp is a temporary of the type, correct? It's not an integer. If it's an employee, I need employee temp, correct? If it's a car, I need a car temp, correct? So I'm going to change that int to temp2. That's uh, change that int to type 2. And then I sit back and take a look at it to see what's wrong with the swap thingy. OK, so first it's going to say, Type temp is equal to target of A. What is target of A? Target of A is a type, right? Whatever it is. That statement that Live 5 tells me that the type I have 
must be able to get copied correctly. Otherwise, this template's going to fail. Because I have assignment at the moment of creation. What am, I, what am I assigning to? Another object of the same type. That's a copy constructor, right? Which means I have to write in my notes for the template of swap, the object that is being used must be copied properly. Which means if it's dynamic, it should have a copy constructor. If it's not dynamic, I don't care. It's going to work anyway. Right? Then, I have target of A is equal to target of B. Type equal to type. What does it mean? Assignment operator should work with my type. If the object that I have doesn't work with assignment, then I'm in trouble. So, and the rest, the rest is the same. So my swap, template swap, should have two things. This is a question that I'm going to ask you in final exam, for example. For example, again, for example, this question is not going to be a final exam 100%. For example, OK? I'm going to tell you, this is a template. OK? Tell me what characteristics the type should have for this template to work. If it's that swap, you have to tell me it should be copied properly, and it should have assignment operator working properly for it. Done. OK? You should walk through and see what's, what's, what is something special happening. Now let's do the sort. Uh, template. Again, a template works only for the scope that is coming after. So at line 9, there is no template anymore. At line 9, there is no template anymore. I'm going to write the next one. So I'm going to write over here, template, class, type. OK, tem, p, eight. Thank you. So, so now, take a look. What is being sorted here? First argument, second argument, or third argument? What is being sorted here? What is being sorted here? First argument, second argument, or third argument? First argument, therefore, that int is my type. Size is not going to change. Five employees, five cars, five integers, five doubles. Size is size. It's always integer. I don't need to change that. <laughs> All right. All right? Size is always size. So this has to be type. OK? That, those remain. Now in here. Int i, int j. Do I need to change them? No, they are loop counters. Who cares? They are integers. I'm not supposed to change that. Correct? Correct? Are we OK? Huh? Think about it for a second. You say, what is, what is this i supposed to do? Is a counter for the loop, correct? Now, let's say I want to sort cars. So you say car, an array of cars called A. Then you're going to say car I, car J. A car being equal to 0, car being less than size minus. Doesn't make sense. Change things that they make sense. Will it work? Of course not. It won't work, but it doesn't make sense either. You are having a loop to count through things. You don't change the counter if you don't need it. Do I, am I making sense? All right. Beautiful. So that's i and j remains integer. Now in here, I'm going to come. Take a look. A loop, size, everything's good. Boolean ascending. The only thing that over here is a little fishy is this. The greater than sign. I have aj. What is aj? aj is a type, correct? So I have type greater than type. You immediately note the type that is being sorted must work with greater than sign operator. It must mean something to it. Otherwise, it won't work. Then you come to if statement. Everything's good. Swap. I'm passing the address. I can pass the address of anything. Then who cares? That's good. Else if I have aj now less than. 
So greater than, less than, which means the object that I'm using, the greater than and less than should work with them. Okay? Your date has less than and greater than in it, right? The date that you had. Correct? In your project. So you can actually sort dates with this. Right? Lots of you, bad people. Lots of you, you did greater than or equal, you implemented that. Then when you were doing less than, you rewrote the whole thing. Reuse your code. When you implemented greater than or equal, less than is only not that. Call the function again. You wrote code for every single one from scratch. Reuse your code. Okay, not equal is a not in front of equal. If you created not equal, you know what equal is. Equal is not not equal. Use one in the other. Reuse your code, please. All right? Just remember it. Sorry. Anyways, so that's that one. And that's it. So my sort works. Now, attention. Attention. Achtung. Listen to me. Important. Very important. Very, very important. I just mentioned, if I don't call the function sort, will compiler create anything for me? No, because I didn't use it. So all that thing is garbage for no good. But when I have it, it will use it. So it's not going to make any difference. If I run it right now, it's going to work exactly like previous time. Because it's sort int, it's going to sort it anyway. So the compiler will generate the integer sort, and it will run. There's no problem with that. But how can I reuse this for other things? The way we did it in C was to create a header file, put the prototype of the function in a header file, then have a CPP. Put the bodies of the function in the CPP file. Is that correct? Everybody's okay with that? Everybody's okay with that? That's not going to work out here. I'll tell you why. So, uh, so when you have a header file, and a CPP file attached to that, what happens? This is your header file, a.h, and this is your CPP file, a.cpp, that holds all the functions or whatever is in your header file, correct? And then you have b.cpp, or c, I don't know why I put cpp, it has nothing to do with c++, this is compi c compiler. And this one includes a dot H. Are we okay with this? Are we okay? Now, when, no, where is it? When the compilation happens for this, if you compile this, how do you compile it? You write G plus plus A dot CPP, B dot CPP, you hit enter, correct? You learned this in IPC 144. When you do something like that, the compiler runs to the number of C or CPP files that you have. So when you say G++ A.CPP B.CPP, three programs are running. Number one, compiler will run for A.CPP and compiles A.CPP. So first, this compilation happens. And the result is going to be A.object. OK? Then, that, if that compilation is successful, then compiler runs for the second time. Because a.h is included in b.cpp, it compiles this. But it has no idea a.cpp exists. Because when it's compiling, there is no sign of a.cpp. Compiler compiles every C separately. And that will create b dot object if you have no error. Then, 
the compiler calls the, three, the third actor. The third actor of yours is called linker. What linker does is getting this and this and convert it to project.exe. Are we okay with this? This is how the compiler works. Now, listen to me carefully. With templates, what did we say? When the compiler sees that the template is used, it generates the code for you, correct? If a.h contains a template, and you only have the prototype in here, and the CPP over here, when the blue part is happening, does compiler have access to the source of your, your function? No, so it can't do anything. Because of this fact, unlike regular code that you are writing, listen to me carefully, all the code of your template must be in the header file. You don't have a CPP file. Everything that you have, if you are having a class template, we're going to learn later, everything that you have, they all should exist in the header file. So every single time compiler finds it necessary, it can recreate the function for you. Did I make sense? All right, remember, the source code of your thing should be completely inside the header file. Therefore, if I want to have the sort thingy over there, I have to create a sort.h, add, new item, So let's create sort sort dot h sort short dot h sort dot h. Okay. So put the uh, safeguards, and then we take everything that we have. So there are no prototypes for this people. You have no prototypes, nothing. You have to put the whole thing in there. Like that. OK? Now, if you have series of functions that they are using each other, you can have a prototype of a template inside the template itself as long as the source code exists. OK? But you cannot have leave the CPP file aside. So now you can actually say over here in the prg.cpp include sort. And now it will work. Are we okay with this? Oh, it's 26. Uh, all right. I had, I, had, I had a beautiful program. Let me just give you the, let me just put the whole thing over here before you leave. I have 30 seconds. In this 30 seconds, I'm going to show you. So sit, sit. <laughs> so the program that I have, I'm going to do it like this. Now take a look. This program of mine, it has a car with license plate. It has a student with name. And it has an employee. And if you look at it, in here, using namespace op244, forget about that. So, and now when you look at this, it has an array of cars, students, employees, and integer. And now I'm calling the sort on all three of them, four of them. And it's going to work perfectly. Of course, I don't know if it's going to work because just I copied it, but we'll see succeeded okay voila there you go the students are sorted integers are sorted the uh, the employees are sorted and uh, oh, the cars are sorted okay are we okay with this I'm gonna post it take a look at it at home have yourself a beautiful day <laughs>